Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to what I am calling Workplace Wanderer Memos. These are shortened, condensed videos that are uh, on the same topic of what my podcast, The Workplace Wanderer, discussed, which if you are interested, you could always find Workplace Wanderer videos and podcasts and new episodes on my channel. So do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, turn on that bell notification so that you can get alerted every time we have a new video or a new interview up. What we talk about is all things workplace. But the goal of these memos is actually to start going into uh, what some of the influencers in this space like to discuss. I want to break down some of the things that people like Gary Vaynerchuk, Simon Sinek, Jocko Wilnick, uh, Bill George, even uh, Brene Brown, what some of these people are talking about, and then looking at research that actually supports or negates what they talk about. So I wanted to start the first episode on something that I love discussing, which is empathy. And we today are going to be focusing on Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk, if you do not follow him, he is somebody who is constantly talking about the importance of empathy, kindness, compassion in the workplace, and talks about how empathy is actually the key to uh, his business success. And he's a very successful person, investor, runs a ton of different companies. In fact, his goal is to purchase the Jets one day. So he keeps working harder and harder and harder so that he can purchase the New York Jets one day. But he credits empathy as being the main and, and key characteristic that has contributed to his success. So I wanted to break down the way that Gary Vee talks about this. I wanted to talk a little bit about the state that we're in currently in 2024 in terms of our workforce and their levels of productivity, happiness, contentment at work, and uh, maybe how empathy could help and how the absence of empathy may actually be detrimental to your workplace. So let's go ahead and start with, um, and first, by the way, I'm going to acknowledge right off the bat that this is annoying. There's a banner down here. I'm not going to pay for these articles. They're, they're free. You just got to go read past the banner. So this article by Bloomberg just came out recently and talks about how unhappy coworkers or unhappy workers cost U.S. firms $1.9 trillion recently. Disgruntled, disgruntled employees cost U.S. companies an estimated $1.9 trillion in lost productivity last year. That's one year. Um, there's, when they talk about lost productivity, they talk something about um, absenteeism is when you don't come to work. Presenteeism is when you're at work, but you're not focused. You're not doing work. You're not doing your job. You're just sort of there, but not doing anything while you're there. Uh, we heard a lot about people uh, talking about quiet quitting. This article goes on to say the stakes are high for companies because an engaged workforce increases productivity and that helps boost sales and profit. Connecting better with staff also ups worker retention. One way that I believe we can connect better with staff is understanding them better, which is going to lead into a little bit more of the conversation later on. Uh, the research paints a bleak picture of America's workforce. Only one third of respondents said they are engaged at their job, while half are giving minimum effort. What has been dubbed quiet quitting. So like I said earlier, this is what I'm talking about with presenteeism. They're not engaged. They're there, but there's nothing fulfilling, nothing driving them, nothing motivating them and inspiring them at work. Uh, Skipping through some of the stuff, the article goes on to say that employees want to feel like what they do at work connects to something bigger than themselves. Now, this is a big cultural change, a generational change, where it used to be people wanted to go to work, they wanted to get promoted, they wanted to stay at a job for 40 years, and then be able to go into retirement and sail off into the sunset somewhere. Now, people are looking for a sense of purpose at work. But it's hard to know what people want unless you're in tune with them, unless you're engaged with them. Once you know what is meaningful for employees, then you're able to motivate them by giving them tasks and giving them jobs that, that speak to their heart and speak to their, their fulfillment, makes them want to do the work if they feel like it's meaningful to them. Uh, there's definitely an expectation among the new workforce to have more of a coaching manager type 
who really thinks about their development, Harder said. They're demanding work to improve their life, not just to be a separate thing. People want work to be something that is a big part of their life where they feel proud of it. Um, so let's, before we go into what Gary Vee says about empathy, I want to talk about what empathy is. Empathy is the action of understanding, being aware, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another. Here's a, uh, a, a quote about this. Is We often think of empathy, people's ability to share and understand each other's experiences, as a hardwired trait, but it's actually more like a skill. The right experiences, habits, and practices can increase our empathetic capacity. And this is an important piece, is that it Becoming empathetic requires us as leaders to do certain things to be able to develop that skill, develop that muscle, so that we can become more in tune with uh, the people that we work with. Oftentimes, that requires us to become more in tune with ourselves first. Um, down here, I just want to highlight kind of sympathy versus empathy. Uh, sympathy and empathy both refer to a caring response to the emotional state of another person, but a distinction between them is typically made, while sympathy is a feeling of sincere concern for someone who is experiencing something difficult or painful. Empathy involves actively sharing in the emotional experience of the other person. All right, Gary Vee. Gary Vee says, empathy is a superpower. I always default into what's in their mind, how does it affect them? It's made me a good communicator, salesman, sibling, leader, but most of all, it's made me kind. And there was a, uh, a couple comments people made. Along with self-awareness, it's so huge, talking about empathy. Empathy is the superpower, has helped me in dealing with my brother who suffers from schizophrenia and ended up at my door homeless. This speaks to something I talk about all the time, that leadership isn't just about organizational leadership. Sometimes we have to be a leader in our own family and, and understand them so that we can uh, help navigate difficult situations. He also brings up, uh, wrote an article in 2016 that empathy was one of the keys to his success in business. And he says, you might ask yourself, am I being empathetic because I care? Or am I being empathetic because I know being understanding will give me leverage in the situation? The answer is both. There's so much that goes into being empathetic and it's a long, uh, made for another video maybe, or a longer workplace wonderer conversation. But the idea is that we can connect with other, pe other people if we understand what they truly want. The idea of being empathetic helps us understand that every interaction we have is a form of negotiation. And unless we understand what the other person wants, we can't negotiate that interaction appropriately because we're so focused on ourselves and our own wants and needs that we're being selfish. The other person ends up pushing back because they want to get what they want. So if we can understand where somebody's requests, complaints, uh, happiness, motivations are coming from, if we can get in their mind for a moment and feel what they're feeling, then we can figure out a more appropriate way to approach each situation we're in. The best salespeople are the ones who realize that the incredible power of empathy can understand the other party without them explicitly stay, saying it, stating it. Um, and he also talks about kindness builds emotional capital. There's something um, I love looking at. So emotional capital is uh, sort of like if you imagine you're building, uh, you're adding deposits to a bank of building capital uh, of a connection between you and another person. Doing so helps you become comfortable and you're developing trust there. So building that emotional capital builds trust between two people and helps you become more effective in that relationship. I like to focus on psychological capital, which I'm just going to quickly touch on this. Psychological capital is a collection of our four healthy psychological states that enhance well-being and performance, hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. Together, the four states contribute more than the sum of their parts. In the workplace, individual employees can build psychological capital to enhance their personal performance, and employers can build psychological capital to enhance organizational performance across teams and entire workforces. 
Notice how none of these are hard skills, like trainings and development and learning new skills, or hard skills at work, like a, how to operate a new system or how to work within a, a, a new technology that we've brought into the organization. This is about building hope that there's possibility for a future, that we're, we're, we're improving the world around us. Efficacy, feeling confident in ourselves that we can do a job and do it well. Resilience, bouncing back when, when things happen that are out of our control or unexpected roadblocks come in the way. And optimism, feeling positive about the work that we're doing, knowing that there's a bright future. Optimism isn't a blind, uh, toxic positivity. Optimism is a, a, a feeling that I know if we keep doing the right thing, good things will happen. So let's break down the science. So this first article, um, I wanted to break down a few things. So I'm going to, I'll reference each of these articles in the, the comment below, the caption below. Um, so we're going to go through these quickly. So this article is called Awakening Compassion in Managers, a New Emotional a new emotional skills intervention to improve managerial compassion. Um, so this talks about compassion, and compassion has a lot to do with empathy. For instance, compassion in organizations has been associated with improved cooperation and trust. There goes that trust piece I was talking about. A more pro-social identity, feeling connected to those around us, and increased sense of worth and value. Does that, doesn't that sound like a psychological capital I was just talking about? Moreover, among public service employees, a longitudinal study showed that compassion from supervisors positively predicted future work engagement, organizational citizenship behavior, client-rated service-oriented performance, being better with your clients, and decreased job burnout, something that's huge today. Compassionate behavior has also been associated with the increased attachment and commitment to one's organization and with lower turnover rates. Also, acting compassionately has been related to others perceiving one's leadership capability and intelligence as higher. So the idea that you can be a leader and be compassionate towards others actually makes you look better. It makes others perceive you better. And we know perception is everything in business. If you want your followers to follow you, you have to be perceived in a certain light. That's all that matters. The perception is the most important piece. So acting compassionately has been related to others perceiving one's leader, their leadership capability and intelligence it makes you look smarter, higher. Um, a couple more notes here. Compassion, as noted, involves four sub-processes, the noticing feelings, acting, and sense-making, which all as we argue below, can be strengthened through certain emotional skills. Uh, they go through a bunch of other stuff here. I'm just going to jump down here. Second, the most closely associated with compassion is empathetic concern, which means other-oriented feelings that are most often congruent with the perceived welfare of the other person. Empathetic concern is said to be the motivator of pro-social thoughts and actions. I love that. This is basically saying that we need to be able to get out of our own head and remember that leadership isn't about us. It's about the people we're serving. So if we're able to serve other people and we're able to get into their head and understand what they're feeling, what they're thinking, and then adapt our behaviors to what they need, we can actually be a motivator of more pro-social thoughts and action, people wanting to work together and trust each other. Let's go to the next one. So this is about a, uh, a healthcare and over 2020. This is really talking about leadership. Um, sorry, uh, COVID. Um, empathetic organizational leaders during crises crises are cognizant of employees' facial expressions, tone, pitch, verbal, and nonverbal cues as a sign of distress and the need to mitigate the crisis. That's some of the self-work that you're going to have to do as a leader is learn to be really good about paying attention to not just what a person is saying, but their tone, their facial expressions, their pitch, their verbal and nonverbal cues. You need to become more in tune and mindful with yourself so then you can become more mindful of others. I'll read this real quick. When leaders play... When leaders display empathy, employees believe the leaders are sympathetic and concerned about their well-being and value. Empathetic organizational leaders value cultures, perspectives, skills, capabilities, and treat each employee with respect. 
Furthermore, leaders can demonstrate empathy through the reactionary behaviors to employees' reporting of issues and concerns. In this way, they can bridge the gap between leadership and employees, which will enhance overall functioning within the healthcare system. This is just about a healthcare system, but we know that this really applies to all other uh, organizational systems as well. Okay, so let's go to the next one. I love this one because it's called I Feel Your Pain, which is so perfect for empathy. Um, so let's go here. I love that they start off for, for most employees, work is an inherently social activity. We need to break this idea that workplaces are just filled with numbers and realize that workplaces are filled with people. The people that require social interaction work is a social activity. Everything is about working together, unless you work alone, but even then you're interacting with other people in some form or another. It's inherently a social activity. Um, as originally defined by Hatfield, um, I don't want to butcher that name, Chapio and Rapson, emotional contagion is the tendency to automatically mimic and synchronize expressions, vocalizations, postures, and movements with those of another person and consequently to converge emotionally. In our view, this is this conceptualization of emotional contagion represents one possible causal pathway among the dimensions of empathy in which component of behavioral empathy the behavioral mirroring results in subsequent affective empathy, emotional convergence. So to quickly explain this is that empathy is contagious, is another way of, of looking at this. The idea is that once a leader is uh, modeling certain behaviors like empathy and caring about others, that tends to spread throughout the entire culture. So once you you start setting a precedent of caring about other people, other people will start caring about other people. And that's how you really improve a culture using empathy. It creates um, ultimately more of that psychological capital that I was talking about more, which makes you a more productive and effective organization. Uh, let's go here. There is some evidence that people higher in trait cognitive empathy, which is a you know, a form of empathy may be perceived as better performers by others. For example, Fox and Spencer found job candidates trait perspective taking predicting raiders decisions to hire. That's a mouthful. Uh, to hire the candidate and perceive candidate qualifications in a stimulated simulated job interview. So the idea here is that um, being empathetic actually makes you more attractive. So it doesn't just apply to leaders, but it applies to everybody else. If you're running, let's say, a sales team, you want to promote empathy and the use of empathy within your team because it makes the people on your team more attractive to others and more likable. Playhort and Huckle found that trait empathy was positively related to both sales performance and increases in sales performance over time. There you go. And I just loved the ending here of, uh, to our fellow empathy scholars, we feel your pain. The article does go on to break down a number of ways that some of the research on empathy is a bit conflicting or confusing. They did find a ton of stuff out there that supports empathy in the workplace. So it wasn't, that wasn't the issue. It was just how it's reported on or what specifically types of empathy uh, have been reported and studied in the past can create some confusion and are a bit broad. And lastly, this is an interesting concept. Um, I'm just going to touch on this quickly, but this is the idea of the sort of anti-empathy and what happens in organizations where people are not hearing others and are treating others poorly and how that also spreads. Um, I don't need to go into a whole bunch of this, but uh, let's just say here, um, basically the article goes into a number of ways that they, when they studied this, that due to the appraisal theory of emotions, people have a tendency to uh, mimic what they see their leaders do. And in that, we see that uh, if there is an abusive supervisor, they actually get used to that and they start abusing each other. 
within the organization and it sort of becomes a hostile work environment because when they see someone being abused, they actually uh, associated that with competitiveness and they become happy that another person is being abused. That's the Schadenfreude that they're talking about. Um, they become happy another person's being abused, one, because it's not them, and two, because they feel superior to the other people around them. So that type of negative energy and attacks and uh, toxic behavior is actually very toxic, not just in those one instances and to that specific employee, but to the whole culture over time. That same contagion we talked about before actually uh, goes both ways. It can be positive and negative. So this has been another Workplace Wonderer memo. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there was enough information in here and it wasn't too much for you uh, to follow. Please let me know in the comments how I can improve these videos if you enjoyed it. If not, uh, give me a thumbs up down there. Give me a little bit of like. Give me a little bit of love. Share this if you'd like it. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episodes of the Workplace Wonderer podcast and some more Workplace Wonderer memos. Thanks, guys. Oh, so to answer the question, is Gary Vaynerchuk wrong about empathy? No, he's not wrong about empathy. Empathy is very important in the workplace. I'll see you on another episode.